Hi everyone, welcome to week 7 of HSCI 6240. This week we're talking about the Affordable Care Act. So uh, I'm going to talk generally about the goal of the Affordable Care Act and uh, talk about some recent news regarding the ACA implementation. Some of you may have heard there is a delay in the employer mandate uh, for the ACA, which was supposed to start in 2014. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk uh, about some of the implementation highlights, just go through some of the things that have already happened and are currently happening and, and will happen in the future. Okay, so uh, back in 2009, Obama said over and over again uh, that uh, the goal of uh, this reform at that time, it wasn't clear what the name of it was going to be, uh, at least the final name was going to be. Um, the goal was to create a quality, affordable health care uh, healthcare system, I'd say, for every American. So, so the, this really goes back to um, the pillars of the healthcare system or healthcare policy that we talked about early in the course and which we went through uh, individually uh, early in the course. So we've, we've talked about cost issues. We had a couple of classes on cost. We talked about quality and access. Then we shifted over to talking about prevention because prevention is really uh, an area of um, health care and health system and also business uh, change and reform uh, that can actually slow down costs probably faster than anything. So if we are a healthier country, then that means we utilize less health care, right? Uh, so we can save ourselves some money because about 70% of our costs are related to our behaviors. So if we can modify our lifestyle, modify our behaviors, then we probably wouldn't be having many conversations about the cost of health care because in a, in a nation with as much money as we have, uh, we would have plenty of money to cover the other health care problems that we have. Um, and we could spend more of our time researching things that uh, we don't know how to treat, uh, certain types of cancers, genetic illnesses, and so on. Um, instead of spending our time on things that we know how to address. But that's uh, clearly where we spend a lot of time these days. So uh, Obama talks about quality, right? A quality healthcare system, access. He mentions every American. That's an access. He's implying access there. So everyone will have access to this system. Um, and affordable. Um, that's the cost element. So those are all the three pillars that we've talked about uh, in this class uh, during the early weeks. All right. So there's some recent... Uh, news on ACA implementation and the news is that the employer mandate um, is actually going to roll out a year after it was supposed to start. So it's supposed to start in 2014 which means that employers were already gearing up to um, report information to the IRS uh, with regards to whether or not they were insuring their workers uh, in order to adhere to the employer mandate. Uh, now, for the employer mandate, if you have more than 50 full-time employees, then you need to provide them with health insurance. And if you don't, then you're penalized, right? Uh, the penalty currently is $2,000 per worker. So um, I'm sure many of you have heard sort of mixed you know, view, viewpoints about this particular mandate. This one was not challenged in court uh, at all. Um, this one uh, was viewed as something that uh, government... Uh, typically does. Government places a lot of restrictions on uh, employers in the country and uh, no one thought this was uh, necessarily coercive uh, of employers, although you know there are people who make, uh, make that uh, at least point out that this runs up the cost for employers and uh, that we shouldn't have the federal government acting in this way. Um, so, uh, but the goal here is for employers to either provide insurance themselves or uh, if they're going to let their workers go out uh, and use the health insurance exchange uh, that we've talked about before, then the employers ought to pay something into the system because what they're doing when they let their workers go use the health insurance exchange is that they're putting the burden on the rest of America, uh, on the rest of us taxpayers, uh, to take care of those individuals or to at least to provide subsidies to those individuals for the uh, health insurance that they're going to purchase through the health insurance exchange. And since there will be a requirement in 2014 that everyone, with some exceptions, uh, should have health insurance, uh, then these individuals are going to be uh, looking for health insurance, we think. So, um, so uh, the idea is that employers should share in that responsibility. So this requirement is also is actually called the employer shared responsibility uh, requirement. And when you when refer to the penalty, it's recall, called the employer shared responsibility payment. So 
employers have actually pointed out that um, most employers who have to report uh, that they have that they're insuring workers are actually already doing it so it turns out that most larger employers are already insuring workers so they consider some of this reporting to be burdensome um, also there just aren't good systems already in place to figure out how you go about reporting this uh, what information needs to report and so on so uh, what the administration is doing is saying that they need to really hold back on implementing this and instead of it starting in 2014 it's going to start in 2015 all right. Um, so um, there, this is also going to uh, they're also going to delay reporting by some insurers, too, um, who uh, there's a number of requirements that insurers have to report. And those are going to be held back, too. But the big one is the employee mandate. That's the one that's receiving the most attention. Um, now, <laughs> the impl implication of uh, holding back a year on this is that uh, employers that don't offer health insurance to their workers so those that have not been offering health insurance in the past and were going to have to starting in 2014 now they really get a free year uh, where they can sit back and say well hey why don't we just let our uh, workers go use the health insurance exchange and they can actually decide themselves whether it makes sense for them uh, to um, to do that or uh, to actually pay for health insurance themselves, right? So, so this actually gives uh, these employers a, a bit of a test case. And also larger employers uh, who are already providing health insurance to their workers might say, hey, well, you know, why don't we actually stop doing it? Because now we got this free year where we're not forced to insure our workers. Now, I don't, I don't think any large employers are going to do that in mass because they they offer this benefit to their workers because they want some of the uh, most competitive workers in our um, in our economy in our workforce so I don't think they're going to do that in mass but you may have some medium-sized em employers some medium-sized businesses uh, doing this uh, and actually just trying to you know trying it out to see well you know uh, does it make more sense to use the health insurance exchange for our workers and, and pay the penalty of, t of 2k per person which we can predict and pre businesses like predictable costs or um, does it make sense to actually uh, insure them ourselves so so we'll see you know kind of how that uh, pans out moving forward but that's just something for you to know about there's a story in it in the uh, Washington Post about it. Uh, Fox News has reported on it, and so on. It's uh, it's it's a news story that's out there, and um, you probably heard a little bit about it already. Okay, uh, so now I'm just going to walk through some of the actions that have already taken place and are going to take place in the future. Um, uh, if you haven't already seen this, I, I suggest you take a look at this uh, video created by Kaiser Family Foundation. They actually spent I think maybe one or two million dollars creating this really snazzy video uh, with narrated by uh, Koki Roberts uh, from I think from ABC News if I remember correctly so um, it's, it's it's really well done it's uh, it's a good way for people who want to know generally what's going on with health reform uh, to uh, to really get a basic understanding of what's, ha what's happening. It's user friendly. It's just a video. It uses cartoons uh, or cartoon figures uh, for people to uh, to to watch and see what's happening. And they have a lot of good illustrations on it. So if you haven't already seen this, I suggest you uh, take a look at it. I put a link to it uh, in the uh, weekly session for this week also. All right. So what are some of the actions that took place in 2010? One is that, uh, and, and I'm just giving you highlights here. I'm not going through everything. Uh, this is this is a mini lecture, so <laughs> I'm not going to uh, you know, beat you in the head with everything that's going on. But I just want to point out some of the highlights, make a few comments on some of these, and uh, I'll be done here. All right, so uh, one thing that happened early on, uh, which uh, many health policy advocates and definitely uh, child health advocates celebrated, was the removal of pre-existing condition denials for children. So basically children with any illness uh, cannot now be now they can't be blocked from uh, accessing health insurance now one of the unfortunate uh, 
uh, consequences of this that was unintended is that some insurers actually decided, well, if we have to uh, cover these really sick children um, who we know have these high health care costs, uh, then we're actually just going to decide not to offer uh, coverage to children at all. Uh, luckily, most did not make that decision, uh, but some did. You know, some just decided, well, it just was not financially feasible. And again, you have to remember um, that insurers are businesses and they have a bottom line that they have to take care of. And just like any other business, they really shouldn't do anything that's going to uh, put them in a red and potentially uh, lead to uh, the failure of their business. So uh, insuring kids with really serious illnesses uh, who did not already have insurance did not make sense for a number of insurers. So they decided to get out of the uh, child coverage business and just focus on adults. But most of them are still covering children and um, they they use the healthy children because there are plenty of healthy children out there uh, to make up for these kids who are really sick who require uh, a lot of care and a lot of expenditures. Uh, but now these kids can actually those who didn't already have insurance can actually access it, and so that's a good thing that happened right away. Um, <clears throat> uh, Medicare um, has a prescription drug program. There was a rebate that was given to um, Medicare beneficiaries early on to help out. Two hundred fifty dollars was sent out uh, to Medicare to uh, Medicare beneficiaries who had the prescription drug program in order to help cover their drug costs. So. Uh, some of you may have heard of something called the Medicare prescription drug donut hole. All that refers to is a gap in the coverage uh, that has existed since the Medicare prescription drug program started. And what I mean by gap in care, a gap in the uh, coverage is that um, you reach a certain point um, where coverage stops for your drug. So the amount used to be, I think, about like 1200 So once $1,200 of your drugs were covered, then Medicare did not cover anything else until you reached about four or $5,000. And then the coverage started again. Well, you know, that's that's confusing for one. Uh, it, it made actuarial sense, so it made sense to uh, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, as an insurer, but it didn't really make sense to consumers. It wasn't clear why this existed and so on. Um, so the Affordable Care Act is really trying to close that gap in coverage. And one way that the Affordable Care Act uh, is attempting to do that, or did attempt to do that early on, uh, was by offering rebates to people. So uh, Medicare beneficiaries received, uh, literally received checks in the mail. Uh, to offer, uh, to give them some assistance with their uh, prescription drug coverage. All right, uh, another thing that happened is that uh, money was sent out to states to help them review health, uh, health insurance premium increases in order to determine whether these increases are warranted or not. And th these premium increase reviews are really focused on premium increases that just seem to be you know, way out of line uh, with the economy. So, you know, if the economy is growing at uh, 3% uh, per year and the premium increase is, you know, 13% or something, uh, it just seems, you know, it just seems egregious. You know, no, it's not clear why an insurer would need to charge that much more. Uh, you know, the technology probably has not changed that much and so on. So, so those are the kind of... Uh, uh, increases in premiums that states really need to take a look at. The federal government uh, wants to take a look at that also just to make sure that these increases in costs are justified by insurers. So insurers just really have to provide more information to state governments and the federal government in some cases in order to illustrate uh, that these increases are justified and if not, uh, states might push them to uh, lower their increases and consumer groups also uh, play a role here in trying to uh, get insurers to to uh, make sure that their increases are do make sense and they're not uh, way out of line. All right. Uh, in 2010, there was also um, um, well, the ACA created uh, uh, or told the FDA to create a pathway for approving generic biologic drugs. That's sort of still in the works at the FDA. They're still trying to work through a variety of different issues regarding generic biologic drugs. But biologic drugs are are uh, very costly drugs. Uh, many of them are oncology drugs. 
they are drugs that are made from organisms. That's why they're called biologic drugs. Uh, so they're, they're, they're hard to make and making a generic version is complicated because organisms make these drugs and essentially each batch of these drugs that you make could be considered unique because of uh, because no two organisms are truly exactly the same uh, so uh, companies argue that well you can't really make a generic version of these of course that's to their advantage because that allows them to continue to charge a higher price but uh, Europe has already uh, approved a number of um, generic uh, biologic drugs and the U.S. is really trying to get on board and do the same thing and the whole point of this of course is to save consumers money uh, and to lower the cost of these drugs. All right, Medicaid expansion was offered as an option for states. Some states jumped in early and started expanding Medicaid. As you know in 2014 the bulk of the states uh, will uh, the bulk of the states, sorry, that are interested in expanding Medicaid will do it then. But states were offered this option to uh, actually go ahead and start expanding early. Um, and, and some states took took that option and they uh, actually did expand Medicaid to, um, to childless adults uh, up to 133% of the federal poverty level. And also dependent coverage was extended to... Um, um, children up to age 26 of course at that point they are adults uh, the old age used to be 21 and 22 depending on your policy and so now um, uh, you could be in grad school and still be on your parents insurance of course this all depends on whether the parents want you to be on uh, their insurance. You're not parents are not forced to keep their kids on uh, their insurance up until age 26 it's just an option that's available to them that was not available in the past um, in 2010, lifetime limits on insurance were removed. Uh, also, insurers are not allowed to uh, rescind your coverage um, if for for usually for health status reasons. Uh, so, so these are considered protections uh, of consumers. When you see this changes to uh, the way insurers doing do business these are really considered to be patient protections and so that's why the law is called the patient protection and affordable care act uh, there's no cost sharing for evidence-based preventive services that started in 2010 um, and that was mainly for private insurers later on in the subsequent years this was expanded to medicare uh, and medicaid um, and also in 2010 there was increased funding for federal Federally qualified health centers. These are the safety net health centers of our country and also the National Health Service Corps, uh, which basically pays off uh, loans for uh, health professionals to work in underserved areas. So this is really all about providing those uh, health care providers, um, or sorry, uh, making sure that we have health care providers available for people who are uh, really poor or working poor who eventually will have insurance coverage but they're going to need someone who's going to take that coverage and uh, uh, these provisions are focused on providing those people who are going to accept the coverage. So perhaps one of the most dramatic things that we've seen so far happen as a result of the uh, ACA implementation is that we've seen an extreme um, increase in the number of uh, people who are uh, under 26 with insurance. As you can see, uh, they, were, they were already kind of jumping around quite a bit, but definitely it took a turn um, towards the positive uh, after the ACA was passed. The ACA passing us this dotted line here. You see there was a decline before that, um, and which makes sense because there was a re recession. Uh, many of these uh, young people had a hard time getting jobs, so they had no health insurance, and along comes this uh, provision that allows them to get on their parents' insurance. Some of their parents are more than um, happy to uh, put them back onto their insurance uh, after having been off of it for a couple of years. Uh, and so we've just seen that go up steadily over time. And so we think that that is one of the positive uh, impacts. So these young people who might have gotten into car accidents in the past and ended up in the hospital without insurance now have insurance, right? So um, these are not the most unhealthy people uh, in our society, but they do have health issues. And um, now this allows them to uh, to take care of their themselves and not uh, not be a burden uh, to the healthcare system and not have costs that are that just run up out of control because they have no health insurance. 
All right, in 2011, um, a number of things happened. Uh, one is that the minimum medical loss ratio uh, was created, where essentially that um, administrative costs for insurers uh, have to be limited. So for individual and small group insurers, they have to be limited to 20%. For larger insurers, they have to be limited to 15%. Um, we also closed the um, Medicare drug coverage gap. So the gap I was talking about before was closed uh, in 2011. Um, or, or it's being closed. Uh, it started being uh, becoming closed in 2011. Medicare uh, started covering more preventive services for no cost sharing, and Medicaid stopped stopped paying for hospital acquired infections. Uh, again, these are things to uh, lower the cost of care and on the prevention side to in, improve quality. Uh, in 2012, uh, again, this is not all that happened, but these are things I find significant. Accountable care organizations uh, were funded. These are, as we've talked about before, these are supposed to be innovative um, healthcare delivery approaches put together by different healthcare professionals uh, to improve quality and to reduce uh, reduce cost of care. So we'll, we're waiting to see what the results of the ACOs are over time. There, there are a number of them out there already that have been funded that are gathering data. They're uh, implementing these new healthcare delivery models and hopefully we'll see some good data coming from them on how we can save money and improve quality at the same time. Uh, and these are focused on the Medicare population and uh, also, sorry, Medicare and Medicaid population. All right, so there are also some new fees on the pharmaceutical industry. For those of you who work in the pharmaceutical industry, you know all about that. And you know that they're basically essentially helping pay for health reform through these new fees. Of course, they're a business, so they might pass some of these fees on to customers too. Uh, primarily through the uh, cost of brand name drugs, which, as many of you know, is is always a bit of a mystery, and it's quite hard to figure out why drugs are uh, priced the way they are. It's um, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a clear uh, calculation uh, that uh, that we're aware of at this point. Um, so also, uh, there are now reduced Medicare payments for hospital readmissions for certain conditions. Uh, primarily heart failure, um, heart attacks, and uh, pneumonia. So we're trying to, again, improve quality of care, and we're trying to incentivize um, health providers to improve quality. In 2013, now there are uh, Medicaid is going to uh, offer more preventive service coverage if states decide to do so. So um, if states elect to cover more evidence-based preventive services, then they can get an increase in their federal matching funds. So that's that's usually a lot of money. We're not talking about thousands of dollars. We're talking about millions of dollars or more in some cases. Uh, so a whole percentage uh, more, uh, percentage point more uh, of money will be coming from the federal government. Typically, the federal government uh, gives a certain percentage of uh, money uh, to states to implement Medicaid. Um, let's say if you're in a rich state, uh, the federal government may give you about 55% of the Medicaid funding and then the state pays about 45%. If you're in a poor state, the federal government may pay as much as 80%. For example, Mississippi, I think. Uh, in Mississippi, they pay about 80% and the uh, state itself pays about 20%. So adding one percentage point could really enhance uh, your state budget. So that's something that I think a number of states will be interested in. Um, there is also a Medicare uh, tax increase where if you're at a certain income, you're going to get taxed more uh, in order to pay for uh, for Medicare over time. And this is now trying to uh, address the cost issues of Medicare, in this case, by actually getting more money from society, not reining in costs. Um, then there's a, a reduction in the amount of money being given to hospitals uh, who care for uh, more indigent patients and uh, the money they get is called disproportionate share payments um, so we're trying to give them more money because we know they have more uncompensated care that they have to provide uh, to poor people uh, who lack insurance or also to uh, uh, immigrants uh, sometimes who lack insurance uh, in this country and so that's actually being reduced and you may say well why is that being reduced that's a little strange to reduce the amount of money they get for taking care of poor people and the reason why it's being reduced is because um, those people now should be able to get insurance there should be insurance options available to them uh, coming up um, uh, in 2014 so that these payments can start going down so in 2014 you know everything changes people should uh, 
shit, uh, people now will be required to have insurance uh, with uh, a number of exceptions, as we talked about before. There are not going to be any pre-existing condition clauses. Um, there's going to be a report from the Independent Payment Advisory Board uh, I, that will uh, provide uh, legislative proposals for Congress. And if Congress does not follow these proposals, uh, does not, sorry, produce alternatives for these proposals, then CMS will actually implement these proposals. And this is something a number of uh, members of Congress and uh, advocates and so on who have been complaining about. They don't like this aspect of the um, Affordable Care Act. And so uh, depending on how much pushback uh, CMS gets on this, you might see limited um, limited uh, uh, options coming from this group but right now um, if they if they come up with something innovative and useful then Congress might actually implement it so we'll see uh, what they come up with over time there's also going to be of course expansion and coverage which we've talked about before in the access section of the course Medicaid expansion health insurance exchange uh, creation uh, in order to cover working poor people there's also something called presumptive Medicaid eligibility for hospitals. And this is basically giving hospitals the flexibility of uh, making someone eligible for Medicaid, um, or, or sorry, signing up someone for Medicaid while they're in a hospital. So just imagine you're a really poor person. Uh, you are, we're not sure whether or not you qualify for Medicaid or you just did never signed up for it for whatever reason you know you had other issues going on in your life and you did, had not thought much about health insurance and then you become really sick you end up in the emergency room and the emergency room wants to know where's your insurance you say I have none and they say well you know what's your income and you say well I only earn you know ten thousand dollars a year and they say you qualify for Medicaid we need to get you uh, signed up for Medicaid and so the hospitals can assume that that person is eligible for Medicaid and start reimbur uh, seeking reimbursement for that individual uh, based on their income and whatever information they can get. So hospitals have to put some systems in place to evaluate whether this person is likely to be eligible for Medicaid so that they can actually uh, get them enrolled and, and as fast as possible in order to um, seek reimbursement uh, for them. And so this is different because from what we currently have because um, typically hospitals don't have a role in signing people up for insurance and they and they really should especially uh, when it comes to uh, Medicaid because a number of poor people just are not aware of the various options that are out there for them and so um, they you need to really meet them wherever they are uh, so whether they're coming into a community health center or coming into a uh, um, some local community hospital uh, for their care. If, when they come in, you, you need to try to get them signed up if they are eligible for programs. And uh, in 2014, there should be something uh, that they're eligible for. Um, the health insurance exchange will be a little different because people have to pay money as for a slightly higher income bracket. Uh, but for Medicaid, they've really, you know, they should get signed up right away. And now with the uh, barriers to uh, becoming eligible for Medicaid being removed so that anyone who's of a certain income level can qualify, hospitals really have one basic question, what's your income? Um, and from there, they can pretty much uh, uh, figure out whether or not uh, you're going to be eligible for Medicaid and presume that you're eligible and, and go from there. All right. Now, after 2014, things slow down a bit. Um, the the uh, prior changes will continue. It's not as though you know everything stops with the ACA. Uh, these are legislative changes that remain laws, right? They are things that will continue to be implemented over time. Many of them um, are set to expire at certain times, so Congress will have to come back and start them back up again. Uh, some of them change in character over time. For example, Medicaid expansion starts off as being completely uh, paid for by the federal government. Then when you get to 2019, the federal payments drop. Well, Congress might change that. If we see uh, substantial benefits in society as a result of Medicaid expansion, then that might change. Or if we see that it's really just running up costs for the federal government and state government and it's not that useful at all, perhaps uh, Medicaid expansion will change and will go backwards. Uh, so this sort of remains to be seen. There will continue to be uh, changes over time. Uh, but 
the actual um, provisions that are slated to start after 2014 are 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 few, far and few between. Uh, so one is that in 2015 there's going to be an increase in the amount of money that the federal government is putting towards the child health insurance program. This is a program that um, covers children who are poor. Uh, but it, the eligibility levels are higher than Medicaid. So just imagine you have some poor parents who um, do not qualify for Medicaid uh, because they make $2,000 more than is required for Medicaid. So instead of making $11,000, they make $13,000 a year. Just imagine that, that those are the numbers. Uh, those aren't the exact numbers. Well, let me give you better numbers. So imagine they make... Uh, uh, 24,000 instead of 22,000. That's more realistic for uh, for uh, a, a couple with a, a young child, for example. All right. So if they make above that amount, then they may not qualify for Medicaid, but that child is still living in a poor home. So what does that mean? That means that child uh, will not be able to get insurance because those parents probably don't have insurance. They probably have part-time jobs or jobs that pay really low wages, and so those jobs typically don't provide insurance uh, to them. Uh, they may work for small businesses that have 10 employees, and so those small businesses are not required to provide insurance to their workers. Uh, so what happens to that child? Do we allow that child to go without care? Well, no. Uh, there's actually a program called the Child Health Insurance Program that allows children to have higher incomes uh, but still be eligible for insurance. So still be eligible for what we typically would think of as Medicaid, but it's called a child health insurance program because it's essentially an add-on to Medicaid. It provides states with an additional amount of money to bring in more children because as, as we've talked about uh, in, in the prior week, uh, starting giving kids a good start and um, trying to instill those healthy behaviors and uh, healthy lifestyles and so on uh, at an early age can really uh, save all of us and can save our country lots of money and time and energy uh, over time. So we don't want to disadvantage those uh, young poor kids uh, by straddling them with some health burdens that we could have actually addressed had they had uh, insurance. And so the the child health insurance program is really focused on that. All right, now also the employer mandate will now start in 2015, whereas before it was going, going to start in 2014. But as I said before, there's been a one-year delay, and so now it's starting in 2015. In 2016, something that a lot of people haven't heard much about, um, the healthcare choice compacts uh, will start. Now, this is a very much a Republican idea. It's an idea that even Romney talked about when he was running uh, for president, uh, and McCain talked about it a while uh, while the uh, health care reform debate was going on. This idea is that um, uh, currently when you buy insurance, you have to buy insurance in a particular state within the, the jurisdiction of that state. So if you live in California, you buy uh, insurance from uh, insurers that are meeting the California standards. If you live in Minnesota, you buy insurance from insurers that are meeting the Minnesota standards. You cannot live in Minnesota and buy California health insurance, right? Um, so, so one way uh, to get around that is just to say, well, let's just eliminate uh, these restrictions and say that people can buy insurance from anywhere. Um, well, what happens there is that um, in that situation, uh, at least people theorize that what happens is that uh, insurers all go to the states that have the least requirements for them and then you are forced to buy insurance from that particular state so uh, and, that, and that's essentially Obama called that a race to the bottom so the idea is that because states vary in their requirements for insurers uh, that states in order to bring those insurers to their state and by having insurers in their states uh, they get tax dollars and so on uh, so in order to bring those insurers to their states they would start lowering their insurance requirements uh, so that they could bring more of that business into their state, bring those jobs in, and so on. Uh, and this, over time, would just lead to lower and lower standards among states. So right now, because there are, you have to adhere to various state regulations, uh, insurers have to sort of 
uh, pick and choose where they want to do business and they look at the uh, size of the market uh, and they they decide well you know California is a giant state there are a lot of people there they have a lot of restrictions on the insurers but we're going to meet those restrictions because we want access to that large market uh, but if you just got rid of those that the uh, jurisdictional uh, barriers uh, then they would just go anywhere right and they would go wherever the restrictions were the least and then we would all be forced to go there too well instead of doing that um, uh, the legislators uh, created uh, healthcare choice compacts and the idea here is that states can get together and they can form uh, a compact and that could be by region or it could be based on some other terms uh, where they are essentially saying that for our two or three or more states uh, that we are going to have similar standards and that insurers can sell insurance with within this compact of states so you can imagine that you know there are some states out there that already work together think about DC Maryland and Virginia we have a Republican Democrat split there, but these states are so close together that why wouldn't you want insurers to be able to sell to all three states, right? So there are a number of states like that throughout the country where the states might be very friendly towards one another and they might want to harmonize their uh, insurance regulations. They may have similar ideas of uh, what type of insurance they want for their consumers and so they get together they form these compacts and insurers can now sell across state lines uh, by selling to those compacts which means consumers can now buy they should consumers should have more options so con consumers can buy um, insurance that is has been made available to the compacts right so so this should increase choices that's why it's called healthcare choice compact uh, and hopefully um, just offer people more of the uh, a better quality product uh, for insurance uh, than what they currently have and this might actually also lead to uh, some reduced uh, costs over time too Okay, in 2017, just finally, there's going to be an increased uh, tax on high-cost insurance plans. Uh, think about some of the implications here. Um, I should have said families there. Um, 27, sorry, 27,500 for families, not family. Um, and think about some of the implications here. If you have a high-cost insurance, there may be a number of reasons why people have high-cost plans. And should we tax individuals? Um, uh, more uh, or sorry should uh, should health plans be taxed more just because they offer these plans um, there may be people who need uh, higher um, higher cost uh, insurance plans and maybe there's a reason why uh, their premiums are so high or maybe um, uh, maybe the economy changes and so on so so we'll see this will I'm sure be, be revisited in the coming years in order to figure out what the exact numbers are whether or not we should be taxing the plans or uh, whether we should be doing something else uh, the chances are that if you tax the plans they're going to somehow find a way to pass on those costs uh, to consumers again because they are businesses and they're worried about their bottom line and so um, they're not looking to pay more in taxes but the idea here is to really uh, disincentivize uh, health insurance plans um, um, f uh, from making from from offering these type of uh, high cost uh, health insurance plans, so that they'll focus more on offering more affordable health insurance plans. So uh, again, that sort of remains to be seen in terms of whether that works or not, and really even if that's uh, uh, that becomes a, a, a law or a regulation that's uh, fully implemented, there may be some modifications to it over time. So in the future, I think you can expect lots of uh, continued changes, especially when businesses, states, or consumers push back against certain requirements, as we've seen recently here with businesses pushing back on the employer mandate. We're going to have a new president in 2017, uh, so that's going to change things, of course, and that president may work with um, the existing Congress at that time to modify the ACA in, in some way. Uh, Republicans have uh, really been pushing, consistently pushing against uh, um, the ACA, and so I don't think they're letting this one die. So I think they're going to keep it as an issue, even moving into the next presidential election. I doubt there will be complete repeal of the law. 
it's definitely not happening uh, while Obama's in office, clearly. Um, and so, but they're going to have to really work to sustain that momentum to really make this a continued issue. And they're going to probably be fighting a bit of a losing battle because um, many people would have uh, uh, received a number of benefits from this law. And so what, what, what they're likely to get is uh, probably some modification uh, of the law in the future that uh, can be used to uh, as some smaller victories uh, for Republicans on on issues they care about where they uh, can really bring people together and get organized on these things. Um, I expect, from my professional opinion, uh, more incremental change in the future. I don't see any comprehensive change happening uh, probably for the next maybe decade or two uh, in health care. Uh, so, but what you, we will see uh, really small changes that hopefully clean up some of the messes of the ACA, and there are a few messes out there. Uh, so trying to figure out how we uh, get certain people insured who are still uninsured despite the ACA, that will be one uh, ongoing challenge. How we can get costs down, of course, is the biggest issue uh, moving forward. Uh, trying to really you know, improve the health of our society and so on, figuring out what is the role for government, if any, uh, in continuing uh, to do that. Uh, so I think these kind of incremental things will be occurring and there will be various laws that uh, Congress proposes uh, that focus on those, but I don't think you can expect any major overhaul and I, don't, I definitely don't think you're going to see a, a repeal of, uh, of this existing law uh, moving forward. So happy 4th of July to all of you. I hope you have uh, a good 4th and uh, get to relax a little bit um, as we uh, move in move towards the uh, last few weeks of this course. As always, if you have any questions, just uh, send me an email. Take care.